Okay, it is 6.30 and I will call our meeting to order. <clears throat> um, I'll mention briefly meeting logistics. We don't have a big crowd tonight, but uh, anyone who does wish to address the council or participate remotely, please change your name display to your first and last name. And anyone who wishes to comment, one, please uh, use the electronic uh, raise hand feature on uh, on your computer if you can possibly do that and to um, <clears throat> make sure to start your comments by stating your name and where you live um, anyone who's speaking about a specific agenda item please keep your comments germane to the topic and no more than three minutes and um, councillor Bate will help us uh, keep track of time our first item is to approve the agenda. Are there any uh, changes anyone wants to make to the agenda? Okay, the agenda is approved. Next, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any item that is not uh, on tonight's agenda. I note that uh, in addition to the business to be conducted in public. Uh, we have the city manager's review on tonight's agenda. So we would all, we will also take uh, comments from the public on, on that item at this time, if anyone wishes to be heard. Okay, not seeing any hands raised. I will move to the consent agenda. Is there a, a motion to approve the consent agenda? Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, you've adopted the consent agenda. We're now up to item number six, redo, review the fiscal 25 water and sewer budgets and the uh, water line replacement plan. Kurt, doesn't seem like that long since we saw you last. <laughs> All right, good evening. I'm Kurt Modica, Public Works Director and Oops, that one. And tonight uh, we'll be reviewing the budgets for both um, water and sewer, as well as a uh, proposed water replacement schedule um, for the water system. So the topics we'll cover tonight. Um, first, we'll go through the water sewer master plan, which is sort of the um, the basis for uh, rate increases. We're not going to ask council to approve rates tonight. That'll be sometime in May. Um, but their master plan sort of uh, gives a, a overlay of um, annual proposed increases. Let's talk about um, utility projects that we have completed since the master plan was adopted in 2016. Um, review the FY25 uh, water budget and some highlights that are included in that budget. Uh, as well as um, FY25 sewer budget and the highlights in there uh, that are included in that as well. And then finally, um, the proposed uh, water line replacement schedule. So this is a little difficult to see, pretty small, but um, this is a snapshot of uh, the water system master plan. And um, as, I, as I noted, it was originally developed in 2016. Uh, we try to do updates to this plan every five years um, as new regulations come online or changes uh, that impact either of the water or sewer budgets. Um, the basis of the plan is um, is 1% uh, infrastructure increase on the rates annually, as well as um, an inflationary um, uh, budget number to cover an increase in costs for um, you know, salaries and wages and um, like chemical uh, treatment costs and things like that, materials. Um, but that 1% um, 
uh, in addition to the um, the CPI is uh, is proposed to be dedicated for infrastructure improvements. And we also use the water and sewer benefit charges. Um, there's a total of nine cents on the tax rate um, that go to uh, water and sewer benefits benefit charges, and um, those um, are shifted depending on uh, the needs within each fund. Um, so in, uh, in out years, we um, maybe move one or two cents from water to sewer, or vice versa, to, to balance these budgets. Um, initially, the water plan uh, was really focused on um, undersized lines. So if you have a fire hydrant on a water line, um, by the rules, it needs to be eight, a minimum of eight inch diameter. And um, the regulatory focus from the state was uh, to replace those lines that are that are too small to support hydrants or impact um, the system pressure negatively when those hydrants are opened. Um, that's changed now um, with our most um, our upcoming permit from the state is is really going to be focused on um, replacement of water lines where we have a high uh, volume of uh, breaks, uh, which we at Public Works support that approach. Um, and then on the sewer side, um, that is um, really initially focused on CSO abatement, so combined sewer overflows where we have stormwater entering the sewer system. Um, we have what's called the long-term control plan, which outlines uh, a series of projects in order to uh, reduce and eventually eliminate um, CSO overflows. So that's when there's too much stormwater within the sewer system and it um, overflows um, to the river. Kurt, while we're talking about that, um, I know that the topic of the uh, stormwater utility has, has come up. Uh, is that going to be later in the presentation? Uh, I was not planning to talk about stormwater utility tonight, but I, we certainly can can touch on that now or at the end if you'd like. Okay, yeah, just a little bit because I think people are interested. Donna, are you going to talk about CSOs anymore? Or I have a question. Should I ask that now? Uh, yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about um, some okay. of the projects we've done, but okay. I'll, I'll wait till you get there. Okay. Um, all right, so this is a, a sheet of uh, all of the projects that we've completed since the master plan was adopted. On uh, the right-hand column is our targets or our goals um, as far as the number of footage replaced within uh, each of the two utilities. Um, the streets listed on the left um, that we've uh, done work, and then um, the total amounts um, down at the bottom. Um, so uh, projecting with East State is our next really big project. The bond's been passed already um, that will replace both uh, water and sewer along the entire length of the street. If we add those in, um, we will have uh, completed about two, two and a half miles of sewer system replacement and 3.7 miles of water um, as, a, as a, compared to the total length of sewer within the system of 44 miles and 52 on and water lines. Um, so. We are not right on our targets, but pretty close. Uh, and there's been some impacts, right? The flood, we really did not do a, a whole lot of water work this year, although we did, um, we were able to complete State Street, which was a, a CSO project, as well as um, Quinnell Street, which was a water line uh, replacement project that we did with our own staff. Um, and then of course, during COVID, um, the pandemic, we, the construction sites were mandated to be shut down, so we essentially lost a year of construction there as well. But taking, keeping those um, in mind, um, we are very close to meeting the target since we started this plan in, in 2016, made a lot of progress. Um, so that's a, that's a good note. Um, we also have some upcoming uh, regulatory um, compliance work that we need to do. We're currently in the process of doing a lead service line inventory. Um, there is, you know, we're utilizing the state funding that's available for that, but it's a fairly uh, large contract. Um, and then that entails going into every single building or resident self-reporting uh, on the service line material that comes into their building. And then there'll be subsequent funding available to replace um, those any lead lines that are um, are found through the study. We've also been down an engineer for um, a couple of years now. We're actually in the process of uh, interviewing for that vacancy, um, and that position will will 
really be dedicated to advancing um, these infrastructure projects. They're, they're really going to be working solely on water and sewer line upgrades, as well as our sewer pump stations. Um, we've also had some major improvements at the water resource recovery facility. Uh, we did the organics to energy project um, since 2016, um, as well as um, a biosolids project that is currently in final design. So the total of those two projects is um, close to 32 million. So that's a, it's a big number to, um, to take on, but um, at the same time, we're also able to uh, advance the utility work. The other major impact is uh, this this closure of the stump dump potential closure long term. Still gonna um, still a lot of work to do and determining whether or not we're going to be able to reopen the stump dump. But we use that for um, our pipe storage, for our earthwork storage, um, uh, as well as operationally, um, just for maintenance of um, of storm systems. So we have to. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, where that is going to land um, and we have uh, reached out to the state to set up an initial meeting but um, it is going to make water line replacement projects more difficult without the use of that facility uh, on the on the good side the opportunities um, we've been able to get a lot of grant funding particularly on the sewer side um, state street project that we just completed in the summer uh, we had uh, six hundred fifty thousand dollars in arpa money that was really dedicated to um, combined sewer overflow elimination. So that project um, not only separated out a large parking lot behind Vermont Mutual, but it also uh, corrected a, a dip in the sewer line that restricted the capacity. Um, so we've actually seen a, a pretty significant reduction in the number of overflows. Um, there's a structure at the intersection of State Street and Taylor um, that we've seen a, a major reduction in the frequency of overflows. We also got 1.27 million of that same ARPA grant funding for East State Street. Um, East State Street is, we're planning to split that into two contracts. This summer will be the outfall work, which is separating the storm uh, out of the sewer. And that is going to extend from the intersection of um, Main Street and State Street out to um, under the Rialto Bridge out to the river for a new stormwater outfall, which will include a treatment system on that um, stormwater pipe. And then uh, the following year, we'll do the, the actual work on East State Street. We'll start that. It's probably going to be a two year project. It's a lot of infrastructure and streetscape improvements. And um, we still need to come back to council and have some final decisions made as far as what we're going to do on the streetscape. So a fair amount of work to do on that, but we're getting really close to being ready to bid contract one, which is the, the CSO work. Um, we also received an additional $120,000 um, in grant money for State Street through a pollution control grant. Uh, so that project ended up being a little over a uh, million dollars, but um, seven, $770,000 of it was grant money. Um, we received about $3.5 million for the, for the biosolids project and East State Street combined through USDA. So the council has um, flexibility and how we appropriate that grant funds between the two projects, uh, as well as between the funds, water, sewer, and general fund. Um, so we'll have to make some decisions on that. Um, we also have a, a significant amount of revenue generated from the phase one project at the plant. So we're able to take in a lot more septage receiving, uh, as well as the high strength waste. Um, and both of those things were able to generate biogas and we heat the buildings with that. So there's a cost reduction and revenue from uh, the upgrades that we've done at the plant. Uh, also looking into potential emergent contaminant grant funding. Um, we've been told that there's about $650,000 of grant money available to deal with the PFAS and the biosolids, which is included in this next project. And we also take advantage of the engineering subsidies. So particularly on the sewer side, again, there's just, it seems to be a lot uh, more funding readily available, but um, 50% generally on engineering is um, is loan forgiveness through the state's clean water state revolving loan fund. Kurt, before you move to the next slide, uh, what could you tell us what the uh, what what the treatment is of for the stormwater runoff from uh, State Street to or East State to the Rialto Bridge? What what's done to that uh, 
the storm runoff. Yeah, so it's a large structure. It's um, called a vortex separator. So essentially, it um, it takes the first one inch of rain and diverts it through this um, kind of this big drum uh, that's underground, and it spins and separates the um, the particulates, the silt out of the water. Um, so it's not treatment of the entire stormwater, but um, generally that first one inch is what's considered the most uh, polluted. And then we vacuum that stuff out somehow. Right, we'll use the city's vector truck for maintenance on it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no, it uses the pressure of the water. It's been it. It's, it's going to be underground, um, sort of in the travel lane of, of State Street. State Street. State Street, yeah, near the bridge. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so we are we also should just know on East State that we are um, planning to do the pipeline out to the river using trenchless technologies. So it's it's a really deep pipe. We have to get underneath the old water lines on Main Street, you know, 100 plus years old um and the highest pressures uh so we really didn't want to uh, open cut you know tr tr traditionally you just dig a big hole and it's i think it's about um, 12 feet deep which would require double trench boxes and that you know all, quite a bit of expense so instead we're looking at um a jack and bore technology so we essentially are hammering um, a steel pipe underneath everything so it'll be a pit um on each end one two you know, put the hammer in and want to receive it on the out on the outlet side, um, but but also you know recognizing that um, you know the businesses have been severely impacted from the flooding and uh, we're just trying to minimize um, you know the impacts to them as to the extent we can. Oh, and one other thing about you know, about State Street, the uh, the work that was done last year replacing this the sewer line and. Uh, and all that stuff is, is, and repaving, is that all done now? Um, there is one last piece remaining on that project, which is um, the final overlay. So we plan to, the street was relatively recently paved and you know now there's a lot of patches there. Uh, so we did have in the contract to um, mill and overlay that. Um, we pulled it out of the contract and are gonna bid that separately, uh, but still, you know, go through the funding with the state. So they're allowing us to do it as like a small purchase. So that is uh, just about ready to bid as well. So that'll happen sometime this summer, probably. Yeah, early summer. Great. Donna. Question about your statement. State and Taylor, you said, had been, the CSO was better, but that doesn't mean like it's resolved. Is that right. is that also going to be the case when you get finished at state, East State and Maine, that it's, better but not resolved that's right um you know every time we do a separation project uh, it takes a heavier rain to create an overflow overflow but it doesn't eliminate them they're just less frequent it's gonna you know we have a lot of projects listed in that plan i mentioned the long-term control plan um right. it's gonna take you know several more years but to... these are the two big ones these are the two of the the um largest combined systems there's the the one other one is on cliff street but um you know we're not going to tackle that one right away just because of the risk and the stability of the ledge yeah uh so we're going to look to other projects first before we come back to that one um but that is the only other um, large combined system that i'm aware of but there's still infiltration from the clay tile pipes aren't don't have gaskets so when the groundwater comes up you know water goes into the into the sewer pipes um, and then there's just capacity issues where uh, the main sewer line that goes to the plant is constructed of concrete, which has a high friction. So, it, you know, it creates a kind of a back pressure. It just can't get to the plant. The plant has a lot of capacity um, hydraulically. So if we can just get it there, um, you know, we can reduce those overflows. That's what the issue is, the, the bottleneck within the collection system. Okay, thank you. So this slide is a, a comparison of um, other water sewer rates within Vermont. It's, uh, it's a few years old. It was done in um, uh, 2022. Um, and I highlighted in green is um, where Montpelier was in 2022. And then the yellow is sort of comparable rates. 
So we are on, you know, on the high end, but not the highest. Um, and then if you look at the combined uh, total column, which also wraps in stormwater uh, fees, which, um, you know, with the utility that Montpelier would uh, would have. Uh, but if you add all those in, you know, we're like top third, probably, it looks like. But there's a lot of other communities that are uh, in a very similar place with rates. So just wanted to highlight that we're not the highest, we're not the lowest, but, you know, sort of somewhere in the middle, upper for rates. And are these all the municipalities that have municipal water and sewer systems? Um, I'm not... 100% sure. It looks like the majority of them. I can't say for sure that it's everyone, but okay, thanks. It's the bulk of them. And then, you know, maybe this is the time to talk about the stormwater utility. Um, so, you know, with the with the flood, obviously, public works was stretched pretty thin as we were uh, working through recovery efforts. Um, so that project has been put on hold. We had one kind of re-kick off meeting with our consultant, but we have not um, gotten back to it. There, the biggest challenge I think is, is getting the billing system set up. It doesn't fit well with a tax bill and it doesn't fit well with a water bill. That's kind of a, a somewhere in between those. So that's really where we're struggling. We have, uh, you know, a lot of um, kind of the structure of the impervious surface maps completed and looking at parcel datas um but we have not resolved the billing and so we need to work with the, the finance department to um to figure out how that's going to work and then the other piece is the credit system i think the committee wants to have um you know some sort of credits for people that implement treatment systems within their property um so that's the other piece that we have not worked through yet so i don't know i was hoping for july um i honestly don't know that that's that we're going to be able to hit that at this mm -hmm. point um, because of the particularly the billing component is really where we're struggling. Okay, thanks. All right, for people that aren't familiar with the stormwater utility, could you give a quick elevator version of what that is just for people that might be watching or council members that aren't fully? Right. Um, so a stormwater utility would create um, another enterprise fund. So like the water system where you have a de dedicated fund um, to deal with all the infrastructure and staffing and everything that goes along with running a water system. Same for the sewer where it's a sewer bill and that money is dedicated um, strictly to um, sewer related items. Um, we are really behind on our stormwater infrastructure. Um, it is currently in the general fund and you know there's a lot of competing needs within the general fund paving um equipment um you know and, and improvement projects street projects uh so um we have a, a concern that um that we are you know that we have some catch-up work to do on on the stormwater side it also provides an opportunity to uh, improve water quality so not only do you have the hard infrastructure um work that we need to do the pipes the structures but we also have um you know a stormwater quality um benefit that um that could be achieved through the utility so uh so it's based on impervious surface which is uh which is areas that water cannot infiltrate and the concept is that the more impervious surface a parcel has a property has the more they would pay into this fund because they're contributing more to the runoff. You know, they're using more of the pipe capacity. They're contributing more to um, pollutants within the environment. So it's um, it's likely going to be a, a tiered system where there's sort of brackets of um, impervious surface where uh, a property would fall into. Um, state uh, state properties would be subject to the fees. So uh, um, unlike you know taxes uh, they would not be exempt so um there's an opportunity to get um you know more revenue to support some of the infrastructure through government properties state nonprofits actually right nonprofits yep. as well yeah all right um so a quick overview on um 
the water budget. Uh, oh, here we go. And some notes on this. So about a quarter of the budget goes to um, water supply and treatment. So that, um, that's really the plant and the operations that go along with it. About a third is for the distribution system. That's the staffing that um, maintains um, the pipes in the ground. Uh, and roughly a third is uh, administration, engineering, um, and admin functions. And then a small piece is um, meters and, and uh, delinquent fee collection. So we're proposing um, a $3.7 million budget, roughly. Um, and that does uh, include um, the benefit charges that I mentioned earlier. This is based on uh, a 4.2 rate increase. Again, not asking council to do rate setting tonight, but that's inflation is um, 3.2 plus the 1% for infrastructure. <clears throat> and then the components that make up uh, the water fund um, have the, the org chart on the left. Um, we've got um, myself and um, four administrative staff that, that help out with the system. We have um, seven within the water sewer division. And currently, well, we actually just um, added one operator at the water plant. Uh, there have been three and I updated the chart for the fourth that was just hired uh, this month. Um, and just a note on that. So we have a, a planned retirement um, in July at the water plant. And because there's only three of them, it's a pretty strict call rotation. So every third week, um, the staff is on call. And we wanted to allow some transition, some training. So we are um, temporarily going to four while, so we take advantage of um, the training opportunity with the existing operators. And then we'll go back to three likely in July when that retirement happens. Um, some of the highlights in the budget, uh, there's a dump truck funded. Um, we have the uh, a hybrid um, engineering vehicle, it's basically our, our vehicle that we share to uh, do project inspections. We have a radio system upgrade included in the plan. Um, that's actually been proposed a few times. We've had a hard time getting the contractor to do that, but it, that does the communications between um, the pump stations and the plant so that you know, we know when to fill the, the water storage tanks. We have 370,000 in the School Street Water Main project. So it's another project we're planning to advance for this summer. Uh, we did sort of half of it um, on an emergency basis. We're having a lot of breaks in that area, in that area. but we need to um, extend it basically from in front of the library out to Main Street and make that connection and then um, back towards Luma Street. Uh, as well as transfer the water service line so that we can abandon. Actually, there's two water mains on School Street that we'll be able to abandon once that work's complete. Um, yes, we're planning to do that this summer. Yep. And our in-house project for this summer is Bingham Street. That's on our paving plan. Um, we wanted to get that water main replaced. So our staff uh, will be constructing um, Bingham Street from Marvin up to East State. And then level controls at the plant, um, uh, just uh, an upgrade for how the, the filters are controlled. And as I mentioned, the um, uh, the water plant position uh, as we transition into retirements. And then I just also wanted to note that, um, you know, as we move forward, we have the preliminary engineering report on the water system um, that we just recently submitted the final version uh, to the state for review. Um, that is really going to sort of guide, and I'll show you the proposed schedule, but that's going to guide our projects on the water end of things, just like the long-term control plan guides our projects on the sewer side. This engineering report is going to lay out how we're going to approach water system improvements. <clears throat> this is the breakdown of the sewer fund, so it's a $5.3 million proposed budget. Um, again, the breakdown of uh, is a little bigger on the treatment side. The um, water resource recovery facility or the wastewater treatment plant is uh, is quite a bit larger, more complex than the water 
the water plant. So it's um, it makes up two thirds of the budget. Yep. Can you hear that? Okay. Uh, so, like I was saying, the um, stormwater management is currently included within the sewer fund. Um, so when we uh, do develop the stormwater utility, we're proposing to take some of the benefit charge um, out of the sewer fund and move it into the utility sort of to start that up. Um, so that currently makes up 4.3% of the budget. Um, again, this is based on a 4.2% rate increase um, with the 1% going to infrastructure. <laughs> And the org chart here is very similar. Um, you know, the five administrative staff, seven within um, the collection system and pump station maintenance. And we have uh, four wastewater plant treatment operators. Um, a few notes on this budget. Uh, did not include any uh, leachate revenue. Um, was not sure um, before last meeting where which direction we're gonna go in. So that will provide some some buffer. Um, we have the other half of the engineering vehicle. Um, we have a uh, hundred thousand dollars for a new drivable camera. So we had a lot of uh, a lot of pipe damage from the flood, and our camera that we use for inspecting inspecting the interior pipes has just become unreliable. Um, so that's important for us, not just for sewer line inspections, but also for um, flood recovery for that purchase. Um, also have uh, money in for engineering, so. If the stump dump does not open, we're going to, they're not able to reopen. Um, we're going to need alternatives for disposing of uh, catch space and cleaning debris as well as street sweeping. So we're looking at um, proposing a separate screening system where we can um, pull that material out, basically put it in a dumpster um, to go to the landfill. Um, and then also we, um, we don't currently have uh, upgrade to the ultraviolet disinfection system within our uh, upcoming project. So we've um, allocated some funding for that as well to look into alternatives. Uh, and then we have 50,000 for sewer lining. So that's uh, another trenchless technology where you put a liner inside a pipe to improve its structural um, capacity as well as uh, its um, hydraulic capacity. And again, the, the long-term control plan is um, is what sort of guides our infrastructure projects in the sewer side. <clears throat> um, so now the uh, the water line replacement schedule is probably the most uh, <laughs> the most interesting part of of tonight's presentation. Um, so in July we presented on the preliminary engineering report that consisted of looking at um, alternatives to sort of reduce the number of water system breaks that we have, and we looked at. Um, at, you know, dropping the pressures within the downtown and then you know, what it would take for pump stations to boost them back up to the higher elevations. Um, and we looked at a few different alternatives of different ways to do that and then compared that to the benefits and cost of uh, replacing the water lines. And um, the result of that study uh, did show that um, that water line replacement is the most cost effective approach to uh, reduce frequency of water breaks. And um, and from that, the state is, well, as part of that process, the state was really putting a, a greater emphasis on on reducing um, water breaks because of the concerns with um, with the frequency of boil water notices and uh, potential health hazards associated with that. Um, so they've asked us to to make a plan that really focuses on that rather than the the hydraulic issues um, with lines. Um, you know, too small to support fire hydrants. So this plan will address um, 
the, the failing water mains with over a 10 year period at a cost of approximately $10.5 million. Um, and then the second part of the plan is to address the hydraulic deficiencies. And that is, um, that's a 20 year plan. So the second phase, the next 10 years will be to address um, the hydraulic issues within the system. And um, we're able to accomplish this through um, through the plan rate increases that are uh, identified within the master plan, as well as doing um, in-house construction, which we can do at a much lower cost than uh, contracted work. Um, it also does not anticipate any external funding. Um, you know, if if external funding is available, we obviously we certainly take advantage of it. Um, and then there's also three proposed bonds uh, in order to stay within um, within the available funding uh, proposed with the one percent annual increase. And those bonds are proposed with a zero percent um, interest rate through the state drinking water state revolving loan fund. But those bonds, the repayment of those bonds will be within the uh, the normal funding policy. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Now, Kurt, this is this has just been so comp complicated for people, and so I just want to want to try to be sure I'm understanding it. Is it is it reasonable to say that with all this back and forth between the city and the state, that uh, what happened was that in the first part of the communications, the state was saying, "Well, you really need to address the." Uh, lack of adequate pressure for hydrants and and so that means adding uh, adding the uh, increasing the size of the uh, water mains then maybe in communication with us they decided well it's more important to do the uh, uh, water main breaks first and then do the do the hydraulic capacity and and so that's part of what's taken so much time for us to get to this point. Um, yes, that's correct. Um, so it, historically, it's always been our our permits have always um, required us to replace hydraulic issues. There was nothing historically within our water permit to um, to address pipes that had a high frequency of failure. Um, Boil water notices uh, started becoming required, um, I think, around 2014, where there was a process enacted by the state where we had to, where we do have to, um, you know, report to them whenever we have a break that mandates a boil water notice. And those are, those are breaks that, um, that we basically have to turn the system off before we can excavate and make the repair. You're not required to do a boil water notice. If you can excavate and expose the pipe to make sure there's no contamination before you cut it or turn the pressure off. So as long as there's positive pressure and you can expose it, um, then you don't have to do the boil water. So I think the change um, was really from the change in the policy on boil water requirements where the, the state was collecting the, the data from us reporting our boil waters. Um, and then I think there's also some public comment to the state likely where they were sort of pushing them to um to, to require the city to make a change um so it was their approach in this permit cycle um really started with um with addressing the public health hazard is, is what they uh, were concerned about but that was a shift from historical permits um the process was, you know, they initially felt that reducing pressure was the the most cost or the best way to go about reducing the number of breaks. Gotcha. Um, the change was that, you know, we we hired a consultant to do the evaluation and there's a, a formal process um, for evaluating alternatives on a life cycle basis. And, um, and our engineer, you know, pointed out that, um, that not only are our pipes well beyond their design life, but uh, when you when they're sized appropriately, you can reduce the speed which with which the water goes through, and and um, and with that also um, 
sort of the pressure spikes that are associated with those high velocities within the mains. So appropriately sized water mains and newer materials that you know have not reached the end of their design life. Um, and looking at the cost of that as opposed to you know pump station installation and the maintenance and the electrical use and all that that goes along with it. Um, that through the evaluation, it was really determined that um, pipe replacement is is the better approach. Um, so just to go through this plan, um, so the the red uh, on the left are um, are the streets that um, that are proposed for replacement, and this is basically the rough order of which we would we would address these projects. Um, the red are represents just a little under half of all of our boil water notices. And so that came right from our engineering report. Um, so this plan, this uh, slide shows the first 10 years. Um, I do have a couple of projects sort of uh, put in the middle there. And uh, one of them is to abandon a very long section of four inch main that has very little use on it. Um, and that's an in-house project. It wasn't identified. It doesn't break a lot now, but um, but it's a good project for us to do in house, where it's just uh, running a few services and we can reduce the the assets that we have. And then the other one is North Street, which really needs to be paved. So um, just to point those two projects out, that um, that there's a reason why those are in there. I know they're not red and they don't break as much as some of the other ones, but um, there's also other needs that we need to consider. Uh, the green the green um, uh, cells are are in-house projects, so those are projects that our water sewer staff would construct um, in-house, and we'll also do the engineering on those in-house. Um, so to walk through the uh, the columns here and kind of what this means, um, so the first is the length of the project and then uh, the the second column is the estimated cost of that project so the cost was um, those are initially provided from our consultant um, i went through and made some adjustments based on site conditions you know increase those um, and then the next column is estimated project costs so that includes um, a contingency within the constructed projects, did not add a contingency on the in-house projects because essentially those are material costs only. Um, and so those are more predictable. Whereas bid projects, there's a higher level of uncertainty. So the estimated project cost uh, is a 15% adder plus another um, uh, inflator for engineering services. So we do anticipate some support on final design um, uh, plan development for the bid projects. Um, next column is the construction schedule, the proposed year. And and then um, the next line is uh, the cumulative cash outlay. So um, it adds up the project, the total project cost um, annually. So how much money we put out from year zero out to year 10. And then fiscal year, and then how much money we have available as proposed within the um, water master plan is the gray column. Um, so that does change as debt drops off. We have the water plant bond um, dropped off in 2026. So we start accumulating, um, you know, we have more money available in FY26 as that debt is, um, is dropped off the books. Um, so that's the annual money that goes into the fund. And then the next column is the accumulated um, uh, available funding from the master plan. So that's adding up those annual numbers. <clears throat> and then the final column is uh, adjustments for bonds. So the yellow um, cells are bond bond years, and then the blue is the estimated bond payment um, for the, the bond amount identified. Um, and then those bond payments are included in the cash outlay um, and how much money we're spending. So bonds are are added into how much we have to pay annually um, to make this plan work. So basically in summary, um, the project costs are paid 100% fully through um, proposed rate increases, which is the 1% annual on the master plan. 
as well as the proposed bond debt service is also paid for um, through those 1% uh, annual increases. So you can uh, see at the bottom, the cumulative cash outlay is 10.5 million. That would get rid of address 50% you know, of all of our boil water notices. So these are all the most frequently lines that break. Um, and um, yeah, and three bonds uh, we have. Um, the first bond is the state. It's already been approved. It's a $1.6 million bond. As propo I'm proposing $200,000 of the USDA money uh, go to support that project, which is a fairly small amount of the $3.5 million. Um, and then down in FY33, we have another $3 million bond in FY36, uh, the final bond. So those, all this is, and it's in the report, um, subject to change slightly. So we are good, we are obligated within our or will be within our permit to, um, you know, maintain a log of where our breaks are, and uh, make adjustments to the plan. If for some reason a line suddenly becomes really problematic, it'll move up the list. But this is the the, the rough outlay of, um, you know, how we're gonna what order we'll do the improvements and how we're gonna pay for them. Kurt, it, it's a little hard for my eyes to read all of this tiny print, but looking at the third uh, row down, uh, School Street, St. Paul Street, to Luma Street, um, in the construction schedule column, I think it says water pump plant bond end 2024. Does that, is that... A typo because yeah. like you just said it was 2026. Yeah, it should be FY fiscal year 26. Yeah. Okay. And then another thing, just thinking in terms of things that we've heard from residents here in this uh, in this room. Your plan is to replace the four inch water main with an eight inch water main on North Street in fiscal 2030, no, 2028, is that, am I reading that right? Construction schedule 2028? Yep. So that means that the people who are not happy with the quality of, of the road are waiting till 2028 for that. That's right. Okay. I mean, so I'm I'm open to council suggestions on modifying this plan. Um, it you know I think it would be good for council to endorse some version of this. Um, you know as we are working with the state to finalize our permit and this preliminary engineering report. Um, you know I think that would be beneficial for the state to know that the, the city council supports this. Mm -hmm. But I'm open to changes if you don't like the way I've laid this out. It's uh, Oh yeah. I'm not saying I don't like the way it was laid <laughs> down. I'm just saying that it's uh, or if there's just things that you'd like to see done sooner or later. Um, um, and, and is, is the point with regard to both of these uh, four inch uh, mains that there's not that much load out there. So uh, it should be higher, but it's not a serious problem that it's not uh, bigger at this point. Right. I mean, it, um, most, most mains are eight inch unless they're really high demand areas. That's mm -hmm. generally what you put in. Yep. Okay. Donna. I know you've already given me the price. If we were to advise or ask if you could mill, I think it's the right word and re do a, a, a top surfacing of school street. If it were to wait this long. You could give so, us an estimate if we wanted to to consider that. So School Street or North Street? Uh, I was looking here at School Street. I thought it's the one that you that you were doing in. So School Street is proposed for this summer. Um, yeah, I think we are going to have to do the issue on School Street. Um, is there's other infrastructure problems there? Uh, there's a storm pipe that runs under the sidewalk that has failed, and um, and the sidewalk is also tipped, and these, there's curbing that needs to be reset. So, oh, I see, and uh, all that will be done this summer. 
Well, no, the storm the storm work is not funded at this point. Um, part of the reason earlier, like I mentioned, um, you know, there's just a lot of competition within the capital improvement plan for infrastructure improvements, which is you know part of the reason um, we really think a stormwater utility is needed. So uh, again, in some of those roads that have partial work done, and you're going to come back, the expense to do a, a mill and coating to have a more smooth surface is not financially viable. It's not reasonable to spend that money when you're going to go back in and dig it up in a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a policy decision, but um, but generally we're trying to avoid paving streets that have very poor underground infrastructure because yeah. inevitably you're, you're going to have holes that we got to dig and you know the condition of the pavement will go down pretty quickly when we have to <laughs> dig them up to make repairs. Mm -hmm. Sal, did you have your hand up? Well, I was just curious about um, why North Street is where it is, but I, th I think it probably has to do with uh, East State, which isn't really going to, well, it's going to start this summer and then the major part going up to college will be the next two years. So that's 26. So it so North Streets then would start two years after that, um, and that's a complete redo, like like East State, right? I mean, it's a it's oh, it, it isn't. No, I mean this is just water fund. So we would, if we want to do a, a complete reconstruction, that you know you need to pull in the other funds, um, the mm -hmm. general fund for paving. Um, the water will pay for a, you know a portion. I see. You know, okay. What we have to repave or patch. So, so that it's not designed to coordinate with a complete redo like like East State. No, no. This is all just strictly water work with with trench patch. See there's the sewer line on that street. An okay shape, as far as we know. Um, I think there are. Are we've replaced a portion of that since I've been here. Um. There are portions that uh, that probably do need to be upsized. I think there's still a, a section of six inch. I mean, that's certainly something we can we can look at. I mean, North Street is not as extensive as the East State because you don't have you know the concrete sidewalks and the granite curb. Right. Yeah. Um, so we could look at you know incorporating that into the the capital improvements plan. There, is there stormwater? Is there still still there to deal with? Or? No. No. And um, are you in a, is the situation now not that, you obviously you don't have state approval yet because you just submitted the preliminary engineering report, but because of negotiation with the state, you're at the point where you've done what they told you, you we needed to do in that letter last year, right? Right. So, it's, you know, shortly before the flood, they uh, provided review comments. And one of the things uh, they asked for was this schedule. Uh, what's mm -hmm. our plan? And, you know, is it a reasonable plan, um, you know, to replace the areas that have a lot of breaks? Yep. And and with that, you know, we've addressed with this plan, we've addressed that. That was their, that was the main there are other things, smaller items, but this was the main uh, item that, that, that we were missing initially. Lauren. My voice is a little funny tonight, sorry. Um, so just a couple questions, trying to just make sure I'm understanding this right. So like when we had talked a while ago, there was a lot of conversation about just the really high system pressure. And am I understanding right that you're saying like the way that we're dealing with it, there's m multiple ways you could deal with it, but we're saying like upsized pipes, and better materials will just withstand the pressure. So we're not reducing the pressure, but we're having a better system that can handle the pressure. Is that, am I understanding? Yeah. That piece right? Okay. Yep, that's correct. Um, and then just my two questions. So it felt like there was options early on that like had big scary price tags that were big systemic overhauls and then kind of like smaller chunks at working away at it. Um, I guess when we're saying like, this is the most cost-effective, 
is this the most cost effective over a short time frame? But like, if we looked at 75 years, we might, this might actually end up costing more because we're going to keep chipping away and maybe having more damage because we're not getting at the pressure. And, um, but like, this just feels realistic given all the other budget pressures, or is this a good long-term solution from your good engineering mind for like getting us long-term to a really good system that we can maintain? All right. So in the preliminary engineering report, they look at um, the life cycle of the asset. So that could be, you know, pressure reducing valves to drop the pressure and then pump stations to boost them back up. And that was one of the alternatives that we looked at. Oh, they also look at the, you know, how long these pipes are going to um, last, which is, um, you know, at least 50 years, 50 to 100 years. So all of the the length of the life of the asset is incorporated into um you know, the benefit analysis for developing the best alternative. Does that make sense or answer your question? Is that <laughs> So when you are saying cost effective, you're saying like, you think this is looking at lifetime and it's comparing lifetime to other systemic approaches as well. So like, cause I've, I've just heard a lot of people be like, this feels like a band-aid or we're just, we're not really getting at, like, if we're not dealing with the pressure, then we're going to keep having problems and keep going back and fixing things and having more water main breaks. Like, so um, just trying to understand, like, so your assessment is, this is not that this is getting at, this is developing a better system that can, we're not addressing, we're not reducing the pressure, but we're building a system that can operate within a high pressure environment. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, can I, I mean, I, can I, I jump in on that too, because, yeah, you know, there was no science behind, the, there were, there were people that felt that the pressure was the issue. Um, when looked at by the engineers, include and the state thought that might be the case, and the conclusion was actually um, right sizing the lines and putting the proper material in. It's not because we're having we're, some of our line breaks are in places where the pressure isn't bad, so it's it's not necessarily the pressure causing the breaks. I think the pressure might make the breaks worse when they happen, but the idea was to have better better lines and that was ultimately the conclusion where the state ended up and i think you know just to jump on because kurt talked a lot about the first 10 years as as he should i mean this is this is great we're really hitting the worst prices within the plan that we set out that we set out um but the next 10 years is then addressing the hydraulic lines and at the end of the 20-year period uh if we were to continue the you know, we're actually in a pretty good financial position to continue making investments in the system. I mean, obviously, who knows 20 years out what costs are going to be and those kind of things, which is why, but it projects out to be, now we've hit all the, the hydraulic issues, we've hit all the bad, and now we're in a, we would be in a position so maybe the council at some point could stop doing the 1% or could reinvest that money into other or do more work in a given year, those kind of things. So um, it's a, actually, it's a, it's a, a very sustainable program and i think you know credits to the team back in 2016 for saying this is you know this is our plan let's stick to it and get there and then this kurt and his team for putting together this package of saying look we can do all this and stay with the exact same funding plan we've been on so yeah and just one little follow-up from just my experience um and doing water line work so uh, on Northfield Street, I'm not sure if folks remember, but um, we were having water leaks all the time. I mean, it was like every single winter, two or three, and our it was really impacting our staff to the point where, you know, we were starting to lose people. Um, that was a small diameter line. It was real. It was old. It was you know, maybe not a hundred years, but probably sixty, seventy years old. Um, it went from. A, it went from six inch and four inch was existing and replaced it with a 16 inch uh, up to Derby Drive and then a 12 uh, up to um, the end for freedom. And Westview Meadows is a high volume customer up on the hill. And um, and since we've done that work, we've had zero. You know, we didn't change the pressures at all. But, you know, the, the speed of the water now has dispersed through, you know, a 16 inch pipe instead of a four. And so you've really slowed it down as well as the properly designed material. So I've just seen it work. <laughs> I mean, from experience, um, but but I also do support the approach. I I think it is the best long term approach. If the city wants to reassess pressure reduction uh, pressure reduction in the future, we certainly can do that. And like Bill said, um, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for funding at the end of this uh, this plan. 
Um, but I think in order to make a, a a real drastic improvement in the shortest amount of time on the frequency of breaks, this is the best way to go. With my last um, on that, this is super helpful. Thank you. Um, and it's kind of feels like too good to be true that we could do this on our <laughs> but which is very exciting. Um, it, if we were in a few years to decide we did want to go after some kind of pressure reduction, is is this work that we would, would want to be doing anyway? It seems like this is like investments that we need to make either way. Like we would need to be upsizing these pipe, replacing these most. So it kind of yeah. feels like this is work that should be done either way. It doesn't preclude us from in the future assessing different hydraulic options. Is that accurate or is that? Yeah, it is. I mean, if, if you look at the the red column there, a lot of these lines are small. They're four and six inch. So to address the hydraulic issues, we'd have to upsize them anyway. So, yeah. <clears throat> You're such a source of information. It's hard not to ask you questions. So I have three things. One is... I thought I understood that some of the lines that failed a couple winters ago were the newer lines, that they didn't last their projected life cycle. Was that correct? And so, if so, do we know if they're more like that made of the same material? Right. Yep. So the um, newer lines, meaning installed in the 90s generally. Um, yeah, those were ductile iron pipe and um, and Montpelier has... Uh, clay soils, which are acidic, uh, as well as, um, you know, historically people uh, grounded their electrical to their water service. And basically you create a, you know, a battery underground that's in an acid mm -hmm. in a small current, and that just really accelerated the corrosion of the ductile iron. Um, so we've moved away from ductile iron. Um, you can use it if you basically wrap it in plastic. And that is really, if you're running through uh, petroleum contaminated soils then that is the best material to use still so we do use it in certain cases and we do soil testing before we install water mains and there's also state mapping available to you know see where contaminated soils are but we do um, we do soil testing for uh, uh, pcbs um, so is any of that type of piping already in the ground that hasn't failed but we are going to be doing are they part of the ones being replaced uh, generally, the ductile iron are not undersized. Um, okay. There are not any ductile iron pipes on this list currently. Okay. And then I want to ask a what if question going back to North Street. You know, in Northfield, you were just superb. You did the funding combination, you did the utilities and the paving. What if we could do North Street like that? What would it take to get North Street done so the utilities and the underneath and the paving on top was a coordinated project. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a, an allocation of uh, the funding and resources to that project. Um, you know, we it would take some uh, funding, you know, likely from the general fund. So Northfield Street was unique and it's a, it's a class one highway and yeah. the state was doing the paving. So we were able to take advantage of the, their paving dollars to offset, you know, the, the city's expense on the general fund side. Um, so in order to do that, you know, we would just have to make a decision to to dedicate CIP funding to reconstruct. Do some major shifting on our list of projects. Right. I mean, that's essentially what's being done on East State. Mm -hmm. yeah. All everything underneath is being replaced, and then yes, that is the full seven million dollars. I think what what Kurt's telling us here is that North Street North Street really needs to be paid. It's water service wouldn't normally, in and of itself, be a high replacement. It needs to be replaced at some point because it's undersized, but it's not breaking. It's not okay. it's not a high priority for the water line itself. It's on the list because we need to pave it. So we want to fix the water line in order to pave it. So I think the question is, are there sections of sewer we could do at the same time? And we sort of have to figure that out in four years if we were going to do that in 2028 or if you wanted to move it up. But. Right. So the 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 base under North Street North North Street is is okay. You you can pave right on on top of what's there. It doesn't need to be replaced. I, I thought it had to be rebuilt. I mean, yeah. I'm a little worried about North Street because I was under the impression that in previous discussions we talked about you know a complete rebuild like East State, not necessarily replacing all the sewer lines as well as water lines, but replacing the soil base so that the road. Um, 
was more stable. And now it sounds like I was, I misunderstood and my email will probably fill up tonight with other people <laughs> who misunderstood. So I'm, so I'm just curious about that. So I, I think it's best practice not to do utility work and final paving in the same year, um, even with a best efforts on compaction. So that it, you're going to have, yeah, you're going to have settlement. Yeah. So, um, so I, you know, I think the paving and you're right, the soils underneath North street are not ideal and the pavement condition is not good enough to do just an overlay. So there is work, more extensive work needed. It's either going to be um, what we call a reclaim where you sort of rototill up the existing asphalt and turn it into gravel base, or it's going to be um, digging out and putting in maybe even a geo grid, like a plastic mm -hmm. grid yeah. in order to stabilize the road. Um, we haven't, you know, we haven't dove into that because it's four years out, but, um, yeah. but yeah, there will be a more extensive treatment needed. For the road surface but i don't think we should do it the same year we do the water line we shouldn't do final paving anyway yeah no i think that that part makes sense so what what would it take to to get all the information we needed so that we could make a decision on whether we wanted to uh, move funds and scheduling around for to to do the project all at once the way donna described um yeah i mean we can we have um you know pretty like a cheat sheet on um, how much it costs per square yard to rebuild roads with different methods. Um, so we could pull an estimate pretty quickly um, from that, you know, basically the X number of dollars, you know, per mile. Well, for, you know, for obvious reasons, I, I would really like to take a look at that <laughs> if we could. Um, and Northfield we did in two years and that would give the time for settlement and other things as well as um, just sheer staffing time and vendor time and all that. So I, I'd like it to be considered. And it's not in my district, but it's in my town. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are you within the plan that's laid out here? Or the same, like, or are you asking to change the priority of the waterline replacement? That's what it takes to move it. I'd like it to be considered. Were you leaning forward to say something? Bill? No, I was just trying to. That would be one of the. You can't. You can't expand it. On your computer. That'd be one of the inputs. Would be what? What would it do to the schedule if, in fact, we wanted to combine rebuilding the road surface with the, the water pipe work over a period of two years to allow a season for settling and so on. Um, so that I mean that'd be that'd be the part of the input so we can have the whole picture. Um, I don't know that it would necessarily move this project up. It might move it in the other direction, but would at least it would the whole thing would be done more or less at once. Yeah, isn't isn't a concern just looking at this uh, table, moving it up to any appreciative appreciable degree means moving it moving down one of the areas that we're uh, seeing water main breaks right that's right right north street is not on the on the break list well i don't think we're talking necessarily about moving it up we're just we're talking about yeah. rearrange you know a re re-examining the scope of the yeah i mean i think that's something we do in the cip process if you know we want to tie in paving funds uh, when we do the water line or shortly or the next year. I mean, I think that's that's completely doable within the CIP process. So we can approve this plan tonight and still as we get closer to You're those years. Allocating paving dollars for the future. Yeah. Right. right. You know, so yeah. what sewer line dollars. You're just saying okay. this is you're approving this concept of this water line plan to some, you know, so the state knows you've endorsed it. Yeah. And my last for now question was in giving some of the query from residents if indeed we were to say oh let's move this up and make it a 10-year goal instead of 20 the next 20 the progress we do in the 20 next 20 years what if we moved it up to 10 is that a, a matter of not only increasing the money every year but is it also a problem that then everything has more of the same lifeline uh you know when it's going to be uh, living it's full life expectancy. So 
I mean, why have a 50 year plan, I guess is what people are asking me. And part of it seems to be just incremental financing, incremental management of staff, but also that pipes have this lifeline. And so if, if everything has a 50 year life, then you make a 50 year plan more or less. Yes. So help, help me understand why we don't do it in 10 years. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the the main reason is is staffing. Uh, even if we hire out engineering, there's still um, mm -hmm. municipal staff input that has to happen to make these projects go. Mm -hmm. And we just there's only so much we can do because it's not just you know it's not just water lines. We're doing a lot of other things. So uh, the paving plan, you know, sewer replacement. So that's the main reason is we can only manage so much work every year. Um, and some of these projects are done by city staff, oh, too. Yeah. I totally get it. I just want to make sure I was in the right mindset. But you're right. I mean, it is good to, to stagger design lives on assets, right? So that mm -hmm. in 50 years, we don't have to do all the pipes at the same time. I but, mean, I think there is. It's roving. Like yeah. Revolving. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is there also, would there also be an issue with if we were to contract out? Like, say we. We have all the money we could possibly want, and we hire the municipal staff that we need. Uh, uh, is there the capability out there in in with vendors to do to do it? You know, in the next few years. Yeah, I'm just dubious yeah. about that. <laughs> probably not. No, I mean, you would be getting out of state contractors at that point for higher prices, and yeah, yeah. that would be difficult. Any other que Any other questions from any members of the council? And I want to open it up to the public. There's not that many members of the public or not, not ma many people logged on to the meeting that are not. Uh, Peter Kelman. Um, uh, Kurt, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Kurt, I have a question related to the um, wastewater utility. Um, it, and you, you mentioned, I think, something about uh, uh, some maybe, well, let me just say this. If there are people who have uh, land and have the capacity to create uh, water gardens or other ways of handling um, uh, wastewater or is it is there some kind of an attempt to sort of educate the public about what they they can do, uh, besides uh, you know uh, what what public works can do in terms of reducing uh, impervious surfaces, in terms of planting trees, et cetera. Getting uh, getting getting citizens to to do some of this work for themselves. Uh, yes, so. Um... I think you're, you're referring to the stormwater utility and how that's going to be rolled out. Um, so uh, there's, like I mentioned earlier, there's going to be an opportunity um, for credits on uh, the utility fee for residents. And there's also um, a large public outreach component planned uh, as, as part of the rollout for the utility. So there absolutely will be you know, educating uh, educational materials being provided of um, you know, what people can do. We don't have... DPW um, right now doesn't have the capacity to like do designs for folks, but um, but certainly um, providing resources of what uh, what options are will be uh, distributed. Yes, great, that's terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Any other uh, comments or questions from members of the public? And any more comments from members of the council itself? So at, at the tail end of the BER back in July, there was a section um, where the state was uh, was offering to help with funding and so on. Have we explored that? And is that offer still on the table? And is the money still there? And All right, so currently the only funding um, that I'm aware of is through the revolving loan fund on the drinking side, drinking water side. So that um, that did pay for the engineering report. Um, so there's that's in the form of um, loan forgiveness. So that um, was, a I think, a $35,000 um, contract or so with the amendments to do this study. 
uh, fully funded. Um, and also the bonds, I am proposing to utilize um, that loan fund um, for the bonds, which is 0% interest, which is a substantial savings. But um, right now there is not grant funding available within that fund. Uh, that could change, but currently um, I have not seen that. Is, is there, has the federal money not been distributed yet or? Or I have, well, it, it has in some form. So the lead and copper um, mm -hmm. service line study, that is federal money and it's distributed through that same fund. And we are utilizing that, um, you know, it's a 50% subsidy on that, on that contract. Um, but as far as uh, waterline infrastructure money has not become available. Is it? Is it in our future, or not, or is it is it not part of the of the package, the federal package? Yeah, it's not. We know because there was just an announcement today about more water line infrastructure money, but until we actually see what what it means, um, you know, we have asked, we've gone to the the congressional folks and raised this, and uh, you may recall we had our folks from VLCT who tracked this for us, and you know, basically. Uh, they're they're a loan fund. So typically, with a small state like us, um, that money all goes to the state. It doesn't go to individual municipalities, um, and then the state decides how it's going to do it. And what the state has typically done is taken federal grant money, turned it into revolving loan funds. Which, you know, it's not a grant, so that's that. But on the other hand, you know, if you're the state, it it then lasts longer. You know, the money comes back, so they can then reinvest it in another community in the future. So. You know, it's not, it's not terrible policy. It just, you know, it's terrible for us when we want them to give it to us as a grant. It's not terrible if ten years from now I'm the community that's now looking to use this money and gee, we have Montpelier's money back, so we can reinvest it with you. So, um, so that has been the state's plan. They have given us favorable interest rates, and even I think one project that we got a negative interest rate on, so it was a little bit of a subsidized project, or at least they were talking about it. Uh, and they've, you know, they do use it to support engineering and those kinds of things. But in Vermont, there are not big, here's a million dollars to build a water line um, kind of thing. It's, it's here's a million dollar loan to get it interest free to build your water line. But we're always looking and, you know, we, like we said, we just heard, we got the announcement today, like everybody else at the state, the feds were announcing new money coming out. So we will dog that and see what, what's involved with that. Yep. Uh, Linda Berger. Mm -hmm. We're about to unmute you. Hi, I'm Linda Berger from District 1. I have a question about the expenses at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, I'm wondering what the um, OTR purchase services um, are. I'm not sure um, what OTR, can you clarify that? It's on your budget detail sheet. It's on page three. Maybe I wrote it down wrong. It's 326,000, I think. We're looking, we're looking through the pages now to see what, where it is, Linda, so. <laughs> Linda, do you happen to ha know the num number no. line I'm or? Sorry, I'm terrible on things, I apologize. Well, I guess what would be the purchase services at the wastewater treatment plant? Okay, yeah, I know what you're referring to. Um, other purchase I'm, services. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. Yep. It's abbreviated. Um, okay. So that's that's the solids disposal. So that's the solids that go to the landfill. Those are tipping fees for sludge disposal. Okay. And um, in terms of in-house utilities. Yep. What, uh, Primarily water use. 
water use. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. So, uh, Kurt, what you're looking for now is uh, a vote from the council to say we support uh, going forward with the plan. Yes, I think that would be helpful. I'll uh, make that motion. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? That's fine. This was just simply the water line plan, right? Okay, yeah, the water yeah. line replacement schedule. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, are we ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, thanks, Kurt. This has been very enlightening as usual great presentation we learned a lot more than you knew coming in when you came in uh, and just with regard to the budgets just to, to answer maybe the question that's floating out there is you will be setting the rates later until we'll come in with any updates to the budget at that time like if there's changes of information but the idea was because we're in budget season to review where these are at so you get a chance to see that uh like i said normally it would have been last week which was the first meeting after the general fund budget concluded so that was the idea was to review these now knowing that you're going to get another bite at the apple because you're setting the rates later on so you don't need to approve those budgets now so the next item on the agenda is the city manager's review do you think we should do report? all the other stuff first and then we can uh, adjourn without coming back yep. Do we need, to, will we need to come back? I don't think we will. We well, have to come back just to adjourn. Just to adjourn, yeah. Okay. Um, council reports, starting your end, Don? Nothing. Thank you. Nothing. Tim. Oh, thank you. Um, briefly, one question that's come up um, just around the state funding for like aggregate homeless shelter. I know there's a big Waterbury proposal. There's like lots of circulating, like, is that going to happen? Is it not? Like, it's, are, is Montpelier like looking at any options or like a way to participate in shelter capacity for the state if either if that falls through or are there other things? And I mean, it could go on a future agenda, but just, I know it's been a, like, obviously a topic we spent so much time on. So I don't know if there's a short answer. Or I, mean, I mean, the short answer is really where the good and is the shelter provider and they're keeping their nose to the ground and they've been in touch with the state about possible locations here. Um, but library would certainly maybe potentially we could extend the time at the Elks Club if, you know, for Intermer, if that worked. So we're talking about all sorts of different things, but there is nothing firm right now, but they are, we're off sort of an active conversation with them. Thanks. Um, okay. Thank you. And just wanted to thank Chief Nordenson. I know there was a very challenging situation that was handled very professionally and safely. And so just kudos to you and your department. Um, and just wanted to thank everyone for coming to the um, commission on flood recovery and resilience the other night. It was a great event. Um, really excellent feedback from the community. And it was great to just kind of share what the commission's been up to and get um, a lot of great input on where we will go from here. So thanks everyone. Thanks. Um, Chief, I should have asked you to come up to under other business. Could you just come up and tell us a little bit about what happened Sunday? Because I think it was a real success story for uh, for Montpelier police. My notes here, just in case. Uh Thank you, Eric Nordenson from the police department. Thank you for the kind words. I, I really appreciate it. And I know my staff really appreciates it. Um, you know, we've been actively training quite a bit for emergency response, uh, risk management plans. Um, and you always know these days are going to come. So you have to prepare for them. And I think I've pushed for people and uh, processes and for training. So anyways, on Sunday at about 730 in the morning, well, I think everybody enjoys their cup of coffee. Uh, I, I get a phone call that things aren't really good in town and that, you know, we had an aggravated domestic assault 
It involved a firearm. It involved a strangulation. And, uh, you know, we had that building basically covered, which was pretty good for us. Uh, we were lucky we had three people on. So um, we had good eyes on the building, front and back. Um, and one of our officers decided to get a warrant and start getting some staff in there. So first thing I thought of was, oh, boy, this is going to cost a lot of money. Hope everybody's OK. Uh, so the good news is it did cost a lot of money and everybody was OK. Um, but anyways, you know, to get to the, the long story short is, you know, we put together our team. Uh, the person in charge of our tactical response came up with an incredible plan. Um, he recognized our limitations um, and started the ball rolling to communicate with the state to have their tactical support with their tools ready to go if our efforts, you know, didn't go as we, we thought they would go. Um, but anyways, you know, one person was holed up and barricaded in a bedroom. Uh, at about 1130, the, the suspect that did the strangulation came out of the, the apartment. So we were able to grab that person, um, called the court. They held him on $5,000 bail. Uh, so that was good. But then we had the, the process of getting the other person who had a firearm uh, out of the out of his residence. Um, and he also had a federal warrant. So, you know, he'd been holed up since May. And we did the best we could to try and get him out of there. Um, so, you know, we we started to make sure that the neighborhood was okay. That if you know the Cumming Street neighborhood, it's, you know, a lot of stacks of apartment houses. Uh, so we felt like if the state had to come, we needed to, you know, evacuate a certain stack just because they use some tools that, you know, would make certain neighbors potentially vulnerable. So we safely removed everybody there. And then we, you know, we put out notifications to shelter in place for the other neighbors. Uh, I, I know that kind of got away from us a little bit. We did the best we could. Uh, you know, there's there's a handful of us and we're trying to do BT alerts from our cell phones while standing outside. So there, there's a lot of tricky things that take place. Anyways, we got those people out safely, got them out of there. Um, you know, we made our best efforts to get the person to come out. They had no interest in coming out, made that abundantly clear throughout the, the process. Um, so the tactical support unit uh, from the Vermont State Police came uh, they were incredible. They told us our basic our training had paid off and that the communication from our supervisor on scene did an incredible job and they didn't have very many questions. Um, at the end of the end of the day, as we got the person out, he's in federal custody. Uh, there's potential for more charges for the people that housed uh, housed him. Um, and there was no injuries. And at the end of the day, I've, I've been done. I can't tell you how many search warrants and seen a lot of damage and seen a lot of injuries. Uh, I think the total damage was $1,000, um, which I'll take that every day, and no injuries. So uh, a big win, I think, for us, and it showed the relationships that we had with the state police, which was incredible. Uh, Deb Munson was the leader of their team, who was incredible. Uh, I've talked to the majors and told them that, you know, I'm thankful for them. Um, and I think, uh, you know, just it shows how important that training is. So, uh, you know, that that's pretty much sums it up. That's great. I, it just. Thanks for doing this. Please convey to the whole department our appreciation to come up with, you know, a volatile situation where someone's holed up, barricaded with a gun and still no injuries, no loss of life. Great job. Thank you. Yeah, we we, we actually talk about domestic violence and you, you see it on every chief's board now is that the, it's our most volatile call. And if you looked and saw the news in the same day in Minnesota, you know, two officers were killed, a firefighter was killed, another another officer was injured, and basically a very similar call to ours. Uh, so, you know, and I, I think I sent Bill and Kelly a message that says our margins are really thin. Um, you know, I, I rely heavily on training, but sometimes a little luck. And uh, I think we had both of those on Sunday. So I'm, I'm pretty thankful. And, and the staff was incredible. So did you say I I you know, we've already talked. I mean, you guys did an awesome job. Did you say we also had help from partner agencies? We did. Uh, Barry City. So, you know, we're in the preliminary stages still of putting together our emergency response team. It's made up mostly of Montpelier staff. I'm okay with that because I want to be prepared. Uh, but Berlin PD was excellent. They sent a couple of people over. Barry City sent uh, a person over. Um, it just helped us make sure the scene was secure and it really helped uh, comfort the people as they left. I, I, know, I know it's an uneasy feeling. Uh, the people that were watching out of the windows, it was probably like a movie. Um, you know, it, it started at seven, you know, seven thirty in the morning, and I think I got in the house around eleven p.m. And you know, we still had people driving to Swanton uh, to drop somebody off at the facility up there. So it was a long day for everybody. Um, but yeah, I'll take a long day with no injuries every day. So 
sounds like you blew the overtime budget. <laughs> it's funny, you know, you say that because, uh, so you know, I, I keep getting these kudos how good I was doing on overtime, and I'm like, just careful. Uh, it takes one incident, you know, and I'm a, I'm probably at a seven or ten thousand dollar incident, so I'll, I'll take it out of that thirty three thousand that you took from us, if you don't mind. <laughs> That's next fiscal year. Yeah, it's, this yeah. is this year. Money in the yeah, bank, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So. Well, Deeper is making up for it since 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 Kurt reorganized, we had zero overtime, right? Zero snow too, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> but he's taking full credit, as he should. Full blame. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. Exactly. It's ultimately our fault. So yeah. 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 <laughs> but thank you. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Um. Mayor's report. The only thing I I want to uh, also mention the the resiliency commission. Uh, forum last Thursday night. It was uh, it was a funny thing because the building wasn't full, and and we were walking around saying, well, you know, there aren't that many people here. In fact, there were ninety people between in person and and online. And I think for uh, for a, a weeknight event in the middle of the winter, uh, that, that's a pretty good uh, turnout. And so. There was a lot of good discussion. I was in two of the different uh, rooms, and I think a lot of feedback. People were uh, pleased with how things are going, and I uh, understand they're in the process of uh, interviewing executive director candidates, and so things are moving forward as we wanted them to. Yeah, that you know, I had the same reaction. I think, and you know, that room is just so big at the high school that you put a hundred people in there and it still feels empty. You know, and I think that's really because I was the same thing. You know, I started, I didn't do an exact count, but I just sort of started going. I'm like, you know, there's close to a hundred people here. Like, this is not, it's not empty. It just feels it because it's I don't know how many can sit in there, but it's a big room. So yeah, they I thought they did a great job. Yeah. Hats off to the commission. Yep. City. City Clerk's Report. Just a reminder about tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening, 6.30 at the Senior Center. This should be, well, this will be our last abatement meeting until the 28th. And I'm just going to play it by ear between now and then to see how many come in. And but you say the 28th, you mean March. March 28th, excuse me. Yes. Oh, Lord. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's been a real long, long, strange trip, and we're just about done with it. Thank you for participating so so well and so consistently and we do need that majority of the council back for one more meeting tomorrow so city managers report thank you i just have a minor thing well not minor but um one thing i just call the council you all i'm sure have all seen it and digested it fully but for the count for the for the public's uh benefit uh, in last friday's weekly report we put in a summary of grant funding that we've uh, been involved in over the last year or so. And I, um, it was a pretty impressive list, uh, seeing what all the departments had done. So for those of you who haven't checked it out and for the members of the public that sometimes ask, does the city seek funding? Um, it's a, it's a, I think there's about $9 million or so on that list. And, um, you know, in a lot of different areas. So, how, you know, much of it generated by our department staff. So, um, you know, a lot of it DPW, but, uh, and police were really the, the big, but really parks all, all the way across the board. So just call people's attention to that um, because, you know, I don't think we we do promote that a lot. We just get it. We might tell you we move on and we do the, the project. But when you look at it all, it's good. Secondly, uh, the legislature don't have a lot of specific information. I know that the, there is conference committee on the the um, the budget, What's budget the Budget Adjustment Act is happening, and that funding for municipalities that were impacted by the flood, flood is very much on the table. And according to our uh, advocate, uh, looking positive. Um, that's I don't have any any details what that means. I actually have been texting with her, and uh, I was supposed to talk to her at noon, but I had a more important meeting at noon, and um, and then ran into her quickly in the parking lot. And she just said, it's looking good, you know, so um, they're still working at it. Sounds like our our representative, particularly Senator Perchlick, has really been uh, very 
a strong advocate for us. So hats off to him, but really everybody's doing a good job and it sounds like they're figuring out a way to address the barrier in Montpelier needs, but also look at some other communities in the state. So I think which is part of the, the wrinkle was how do we spread the wealth, so to speak. So hopefully we'll learn more soon uh, on that. Those are the only two things I have for tonight. Cool. Okay, now the other thing we have on the agenda is city manager's report. We'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. Re review, right? Sorry. Is. Yes. Do you want me to read this? Sure. So I'll make the motion that we go into executive session uh, to discuss the city manager's evaluation and due to the pursuant of one VSA 113, the appointment of employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. Do I read that? Read Period. That too? But okay. the public body must make a decision to hire or appoint in an open meeting, but it must explain the reasons for its final decision. Okay. Is that the right one? Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and I can tell everyone who's uh, out there online that uh, we do not anticipate taking any action. After we come out of executive session, we'll just come back and uh, and adjourn. So you don't need to stay on the line unless you want to watch someone move to adjourn. Well, I think we'll need to probably shut the... Yeah, down. shut this stuff down. down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we can take a break before uh, we go into executive session.